I'll tell you one thing I know about our worship team. They've got the purest hearts that I've ever seen in a worship team. I'll tell you, don't ever take that for granted. I've seen that churches, you know, that has those big personalities, that it's about them. You know, I'm thankful for the heart of you guys. It's constantly pointing us to Jesus. Love you, man. You remember those times in life when you were running? Some of you think, I haven't ran a day in my life. I'm not talking about physical running. I'm talking about spiritual running. You remember those times when you wanted nothing to do with what you knew you were supposed to be doing? You remember the darkest valleys that you seem to walk into. You know, we really are good at making a mess of things. <laughs> Nobody can make a mess like our flesh can make a mess. It can make a huge mess. But in spite of that, I want you to think about this. Do you also remember coming through that valley and then looking, not necessarily being thankful that you walked through it, but being thankful that you got to witness what God did in the midst of it. And it really in spite of it. You know, even though we can make a mess of our lives and of so much, God is the restorer of all things. And I think that the thing that hurts more than making a mess of our life is when we watch somebody that we love make a mess of their life. I'm telling you, that is a lot more difficult for me to see people that I love. And you know when it really hurts the most? When it's a child, when it's somebody you're related to. God has laid this word on my heart tonight, and I don't know how far we're going to get in it, but open your Bible to Luke chapter 15. Let me ask you this question before we even get started. Do you believe that God is the Redeemer? And do you genuinely believe that God is able to work all things together for your good? Knowing and believing those two things are paramount to walking through the valleys and watching those people that you love walk through those situations. A familiar story I've preached out of many times, but I'm going to look at it from a different perspective. We're going to be talking about the prodigal son tonight. How many people would be honest with yourself and with everyone around you and with the Lord and say, Richie, I have someone in my life right now that really is a prodigal that I would like to see come back to the place of where they need to be with God. I see that. Amen. I believe this is for us tonight. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. We're going to look at this story not from the perspective of the son, not from the perspective of the brother, but we're going to look at this story from the perspective of a father. You know, obviously, this story represents God as the father, but I'm looking at the natural father in this. Imagine if this was you. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. That's not an uncommon thing. He divided the property and the inheritance amongst the two sons. They asked for it. Now, many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. The first thing I want to talk about is this. If you are the father of a prodigal, or you're the relationship with somebody that's in a prodigal relationship with the Lord, what is it that we're supposed to do? Because I think that is what's so difficult. We're sitting wringing our hands, Lord, what can I do to change this? How can I help them? And the answer always seems to elude us, and we sit in misery and frustration and turmoil and hope and desperation, wanting God to do something. The first word of advice is really, really, really difficult. 
Matter of fact, none of these are necessarily easy, but this one is really, really difficult. He let him go. Let me tell you, church, that's easy to say, but my Lord, that's difficult. When you see someone walking down a path, and you know the destination of that path, because you once walked down that path yourself, you know the hurt that that path leads to. You know the difficulties that come with that path. And you see somebody starting to walk down that path yourself. What do you mean by let them go? They have got to have that relationship with God themselves. It can't be because of what you tell them they ought to do. I remember that time in my life when that relationship, I was talking about it this morning, that relationship became mine. And God picked up Richie's mess and made something beautiful out of it. Without that moment in my life, I would not be who I was today, who I am today. <laughs> You've got to let them go. Why? And this is so difficult. It's easy to say, but man, it's so difficult. And I know we believe it, but... We struggle with it. They are God's more than their years. What good would it have done for a son to live in that house in rebellion? He asked for his inheritance, and when he packed up his belongings, I'm sure the father was, don't, don't do this. You're wasting your life. You're wasting it. What are you doing? He let him go. That hurts. You know why? Because truthfully, you are not in control at that moment. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, you can't stop what's in a person's heart. Don't you wish you could talk people into making the right decisions? I'll tell you what, it'd make my job a whole lot easier. You can't. You can't. The first thing, if you are in a relationship with somebody that's a prodigal, you have to release them. Does that mean you wash your hands of them? No. But you let the processes of God take place in their hearts. See, if it's us, we can look back, and I see those moments in my life, and I look at them, and I have so much pain and, and bad memories associated. Then I see the redeeming hand of God and how God actually used that to place my foot on solid ground and move me to the place that he's got me now. I don't want Trey to have to walk through those things. I don't want my son to have to walk through those things. I don't want the people that I love to have to walk through those things. And at the same time, I could say, that moment changed my life, but I don't want you to have to walk through it. God loves them. And to release them to walk through, it's not pushing them into it. Because you're crying the whole time. I imagine the father, when that boy left that day with everything he had, his heart was broken. I guarantee you he didn't eat supper that night. I guarantee you he didn't sleep a wink that night. I guarantee you for the next week he cried himself to sleep every night. He was broken. What are we going to do? Where is he? But he let him go first thing you're going to have to do is take your hands off and realize they are God's. It's difficult, isn't it, Miss Fonda? It's difficult. Let's continue. Now I've lost my Bible. I have no idea where it is. Oh, there it is. Man, this is hard. He had took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. Isn't that true of sin? Let's be honest. Sin is fun for a while. If it wasn't, there wouldn't be so many people that do it. I mean, is that okay to say in church? It's the truth, isn't it? If it wasn't fun, everybody would be here every single Sunday. But the 
problem is it's temporary. And the emptiness and the brokenness that it leaves you with is not worth it. And it's just a matter of time till every one of us end up like this guy. He took it all and he squandered and he found himself broken and said, I'm in need. Here's what happened. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. It takes you further than you want to go. Think about this contrast. You had this guy, he had his inheritance. He was rich. He had the money, he had the friends, had the popularity. He threw parties better than Gadsby. It was awesome. Then all of a sudden, the money dried up. Sin's little fun time had had its course in his life. And he found himself broken, needing more. So the rich Gatsby goes and hires himself, hires himself out to one of the citizens who sent him in the field to feed pigs. Man, that's a decline real fast. Nobody's above anything, but that's a different change. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll leave you more broken than you want to be. It'll take more from you than you want to give. And he was longing to be fed with one of the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. That is low. That is broken. My second point is this. Notice. The father, where was he? Where would you be if you were a father? Exactly. Where would you be? He didn't seek him out. That's interesting to me. When he was broken, when he was laying in the filth, jealous of a pig meal, I'm not talking bacon, I'm talking about what the pigs eat. I've been jealous of that other kind of pig meal a lot. <laughs> He didn't seek him out. Why? Was it that he didn't care? No. It's because the process had got to be finished. If it didn't, it would be a test that he would have to repeat. Let me tell you something. You cannot interrupt the test of the Lord. And you can't interrupt the processes of the Lord. It has to be a decision that a person makes. I'm done with this. I'm going to walk through and I'm going to be a different person. No matter how much you want to, you can't make a person live the life you want them to live. Let me tell you, if the father would have gone to him then, it would have been a matter of time. Just a matter of time. Until he was right back there again. And a lot of times in our good intentions, we intervene when we need to sit quietly and wait for God to finish his work in their life. And I'm telling you, it's the most difficult thing you'll ever, ever have to do. Ever have to do. Because it hurts. Think about the father knowing that his son's laying in a gutter somewhere, broken and empty, in a completely different place than when he left his presence. I imagine if he would have seen him, he wouldn't have even recognized him. In his filth. The rich guy. Gadsby that left his house is now covered in mud, smelling like a pig. He wouldn't even have recognized him. But the process had got to be finished by the Lord. First thing you have to do is you have to take your hands off because you're not in control. Second thing you have to realize is God has got to finish the process. You can't interrupt it. Let me tell you something else about that process. You don't need all the details. Because that's going to do nothing but break your heart and make you more miserable. 
And I know that's tough to hear because we want to know what are you doing? Why are you doing this? He didn't get a play-by-play -play on what his son was doing every single day. What he did every single day is he walked to the end of the road. <laughs> is this the day he's coming home? <laughs> is this the day he's coming home? <laughs> With tears in his eyes, he'd look down the road on the path that his son left on and think, is this the day it's going to change? God, finish your process in my son. Finish it, God. Change him, Lord. Save him, God. Bring him back. Bring him back. Bring him back. One thing we have a tendency to do is we want to know everything. You really don't. Let God be in control of this. Let me tell you the other thing that we go to. We think it's a move against us. You can't be offended. Because a lot of times what we do when we go down that path is we shut the only door of access that people have back to redemption. We think, well, how dare you? You offended me. You took my inheritance and left. Don't you ever walk down that road again. That would have been the wrong thing to do. You know what you have to swallow to leave that door open? You have to swallow your pride and realize it wasn't a decision against you. This all sounds so simplistic, and it really is. But if you truthfully think about it, it's some of the hardest things you'll ever have to do. It's amazing how something could be so simple yet so difficult. Realize it's not a decision against you. Finally, this boy made a decision that all of us will come to at some time in our life. First thing is release them because you're not in control. Second thing is... Don't seek out the details. Let God finish the process in their life. Third thing is you have to live in the mindset that it's not a decision against you. You have to be their biggest support. Fourth thing is you have to pray and await their return. Verse 17 says, but when he came to himself. See, it wasn't he was talked into something. He came to himself. He made that intentional decision, I'm finished with this. Let's be honest. How many people remember when you made that decision? I'm coming to myself. I'm done with this. It was fun. Boy, we had some good times. But look where I'm at now. I don't want to go back there again. I'm done. God, I need you. I need a change. I'm done. I'm moving on. When he came to himself, he said, how my father's hired servants have more than enough bread and I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. What a wonderful speech. What if he would have shut the door through resentment? Think about where that kid would be if he would have shut that door of access because of resentment. No, you've hurt this family for the last time. Your antics have hurt us and destroyed us. I'm finished with you. That was the only way. And when he shows up, I love this. This is my favorite part of the story. And he arose and came to his father. Verse 20. You ought to circle this verse in your Bible. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he felt compassion for him. Aren't you thankful that when you make a mess of things, that God had compassion on you? And while everybody else was sitting there pointing a finger of judgment and condemnation, God ran to me and he embraced me. And he forgave me and he redeemed me and he cleansed me when I was totally unworthy of it. The father saw him. See, he was nervous. He didn't know the attitude of the father. He didn't know the heart of the father. 
she had no clue. Do you remember the first time that you really genuinely understood? And I'm not talking about the love of your heavenly father, but I'm talking about the love of your earthly parents. It's amazing how much of our life we waste thinking they're against us. I grew up in church and I thought my parents were against me. They didn't want me to have any fun. <laughs> Just being honest. Anybody else? <laughs> Dad, everybody else went to this dance. They did this. What about me? Dad, you're making me a loser. <laughs> no, it's called raising here in western Kentucky. <laughs> I remember for the first time in my life, I was 14 years old, when I understood the love of a father for the first time. And I had a great earthly dad. Many of you know this story. I got busted drinking at age 14, drinking a lot, a whole lot. But I remember when I got busted. Think about being age 14, being busted drunk by your pastor dad. I have a 10-year-old. He's way too close to that age that I was when I got in trouble. I remember thinking, well, my life's over. Lord, I'm coming to see you real fast. <laughs> and then dad's going to prison. Take care of mom and Renee while dad's in prison. <laughs> That's what I thought. You know what happened? I'll never forget it as long as I live. I came home from a school bus ride to freshman high school. My dad's sitting on the porch. And he said, get in the car. We need to talk. I had no clue what was up. I didn't know I was busted. I said, sure, Dad, what's up? I got in the car, and I looked over, and tears just dripping off his face. He said, I know what you've been doing. I know it all. He didn't pull that big gargantuan belt off. <laughs> he didn't sharpen up the razor strap. <laughs> Don't misunderstand. I got in trouble. But for the first time in my life, I understood the love of a dad. He said, Richie, I'm concerned about your soul. You're not doing what you need to be doing. And instead of going through that punishment phase, I saw the love of a father for the first time. And I, he loved me my whole life, but for the first time I understood it. I imagine that's the place that this prodigal son was in. When he came back from making a mess of his life, totally destroyed, totally broken, totally empty, he expected the gargantuan belt to be yanked off. Well, if I could just live like one of the slaves, the servants, I'd be happy. It's better than starving next to the pigs. My question is, why didn't he kill one of the pigs? Just kidding. Made a lot better when we had the kids. But he understood what I understood. When he walked down that road and the father ran to him and embraced him and said, it's time for a change. I love you. The next thing I want to tell you, being in relationship with a prodigal, if it's a child, if it's a brother, if it's a parent, if it's a friend, you always have to keep the door of reconciliation open. No matter how much you've been hurt, no matter how much you've been abused, no matter how much you've been destroyed and taken advantage of, no matter how many times you cried yourself at sleep at night, the answer is redemption, and that has to be your prayer. And when that door opens, you better run through it instead of sitting in an offense. I know that's hard to hear, but it's the truth. When you see one step taken towards God, you run to them and restore them and keep a heart of restoration. See, the Bible says we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. That's the ministry that Jesus has given us, the ministry of reconciliation. 
as a father, you have got to rejoice when that happens. Whew. Somebody needs to hear this tonight. The father embraced him and he kissed all over him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But their father said to his servant, think about this. Think about the anguish and the pain that your father lived in for all that time. We don't know the distance of time that passed. It wasn't you're going to pay. He says, get the best robe. Get the best of everything you put on him. For my son, which was dead, is now alive. It wasn't just, okay, it's fine. It'll be okay. You can move back in, but I'm telling you, not ever going to trust you again. It's fine. You've made a mess of things. I love you enough to take you in. Move out there with the servants. Don't want my son out there homeless. No, that's not what the father did. The father gave him his best. The best robe. He put it on him. He put a ring on his hand. He put shoes on his feet. And he said, bring me a fattened calf and kill it. I guarantee you, steak was not the first meal that guy thought he was going to have. After watching the servants eat whatever was left over or whatever they ate. While the dad was eating what he wanted to. He didn't think, okay, I'm going to get steak tonight. I'm going home. That's not it. But steak is what he got. Praise God for steak. I'm sorry, vegetarians, but there's nothing better than a good piece of meat. Praise God. Amen. There we go. Adam's about to run around the church. He's so happy. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. So the first thing you have to do is take your hands off. Whoops. First thing you have to do is take your hands off and release them because you can't make them live the life you want them to live. You don't seek out details. You have to realize that it isn't a decision against you. You have to pray and anxiously await their return. You have to embrace them and live in forgiveness with them. Let me tell you something about forgiveness. It's not an event. It's not an event. It is a commandment. Forgiveness is a lifestyle. It's not an event. Let me tell you something. You don't have to apologize to me for me to forgive you. Let me tell you something about the heart of a father. If he didn't already practice forgiveness, him walking home wasn't going to make it any better anyway. If he had to live with a heart of reconciliation, this is what I want. He forgave him and lived in forgiveness towards him while he was in the peapot. Peapot. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. <laughs> Pig pen, there we go. <laughs> he was wrapped up in a peapot. It was an amazing thing. It really was. <laughs> See, that's the truth. He had forgiven him in the pig pen long before he walked down the road. That's the truth, church. See, a lot of times we think we need that walking down the road experience before we can make things right with him. No, that's a matter of your own heart. Love covers a multitude of sin. And if we genuinely love people, we can walk in a lifestyle of forgiveness towards them. See, a lot of times we need to hear those words. I was wrong. You were right. Let's be honest. 
if we have in something inside of us that needs to hear that, that's an issue in our own heart. Man, that's hard to hear, but it's true. If we need to hear those words to make it right, something's wrong with us. Well, Rich, you don't know the pain I've walked through. I don't. That's true. But I can tell you this. You are still capable of living a lifestyle of forgiveness right now while they're in the pig pen. And truthfully, if we don't fight that battle, we could be in danger of closing the door of restoration to them because we're dealing with our own hurt and pride and issues. But that's what's at stake. You have to celebrate with them. You have to restore them. And back to celebrate. I love the fact that it doesn't say, and the father sat down and recounted everything he had done. No, that's not what he did. He celebrated and he gave God glory for what he had done. We have to live in a heart that that's what we really want. See, I had you say those two things in the beginning for a reason. How many people believe God's the redeemer? How many people believe that God is able to work things out for their good? Here's the question. Why are you still wanting to be in the driver's seat? Because it's tough to give it up. You know this little act that we do? It's not an act. This uh, representation thing we do when a child is born. We bring them up. We have a baby dedication. That's more than a photo op for a baby looking pretty. That is a genuine thing when we come to the Lord and say, this is yours. It's not mine. God, it's yours. Thank you for loaning them to me because this child is yours. And that this right now, I give it back to you. And I realize they're yours more than they're mine. It's so much more than a pretty little baby, although I love to hold them, man. It's awesome. I think there's nothing more powerful we can do to our kids than that act right there. God, they're not mine. They're yours. And if they mess up in the pig pen, in the pea pod, <laughs> I'm going to walk in forgiveness. I'm going to pray. I'm going to hold on. I'm not in the driver's seat, God. They're yours. They're not mine. They're yours. I'm going to keep the door open no matter what they do. I'm holding the door of restoration open because you got a plan for their life. I remember when you did it in me. When I was running and how you came to me, I remember. And now that will be what I do with them. I want them restored, God. I'll walk in forgiveness and when it happens, I won't hold grudges, Lord. I will celebrate what you've done and I'll give you the praise. We'll have us a steak dinner when it happens. You have a child that comes to the Lord that you've been fighting for and contending for. When that when it happens, take them to a steak dinner. Celebrate what God's done. <laughs> Celebrate what God's done. Father, tonight, this is so difficult to live. It's so simplistic to see what the father did in the prodigal son story. But Lord, how difficult. Lord, how difficult to live. Jesus, it is so difficult. But Lord, what I ask is tonight that each one of us would be able to walk through those steps, Lord. If every person in our life, Lord, that's in that relationship as the prodigal son was. Lord, tonight, I'm just going to walk us through these steps. Lord, tonight, I relinquish control. Lord, I release them. They're yours. They're not mine. They're yours. And I take my hands off, God. And I ask you one thing, that you would complete your process in their life, Lord, and help them to come to themselves, Lord, whatever it takes. Lord, it's not that I'm not fighting. I am going to fight harder than ever before, Lord. I will contend for them, Jesus. I will contend for them, Lord, in the spirit. 
I will continue to weep. I will not give up hope, Lord, because I know you have the true heart of a father. Lord, and you desire restoration in their life more than I do. Lord, I won't walk in offense, Lord, of the pain that's been caused to me or the damage that's been done to my heart through actions. Lord, I release it, God. Help me to deal with that in my own life. I don't need to hear I'm sorry, Lord. I don't need to hear I was right, God. Just like that father interrupted the apology, Lord, we don't need to hear it. We just want restoration, God. We won't walk living in an offense anymore, God. Keep our hearts pure, Jesus. Keep us in line with your ministry, Lord, of reconciliation of restoration and of redemption. We release them to you, God. Finish your process, Lord. We will wage war for them, Jesus. They're yours. When we gave them to you, Lord, we meant it. We don't want them back, Lord. They're yours. And Lord, there's a time of celebration coming, Jesus. There's a time when the process of brokenness will be finished in their life. Lord, we ask you right now, and as I pray, I want you to just call out the name of the person you're standing in for tonight. Lord, as we pray, we call out for their souls tonight, Lord. Just like the prodigal son, Lord, let them come to themselves, Jesus. Lord, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, Lord, break them, Lord. Let them look up and see you, Jesus. Whatever it takes, God, we mean that, Lord. Even though it's difficult to be a bystander to the brokenness in their lives, Lord, we will not interrupt your process in their life, Lord. We won't remove the consequences of sin, Lord, but we will let them fall on their face, Lord, and look up and see you, Jesus. We call out for their souls tonight, Lord. Let them return home, God. Let them return home to you, Jesus. Let them get to the end of their self, Lord. To the end of their flesh. To the end of the process, God. We release them, Jesus. We call out their names before you tonight, God. Knowing that you are the everlasting Father. You are Abba. You are the great Father, Lord. That desires that relationship more than we do. Lord, we know there's a celebration coming soon, Lord. Maybe it's us, God. Maybe tonight through this word, Lord, we've decided that we're the prodigal. Lord, and it's time for us to get things right. God, and it's time for us to come home. Break us, Jesus. Lord, we genuinely want you. We're tired of this life, God. We want you, Lord. We're broken and empty and unfulfilled, God, and we want you. We need you, Jesus. We need you. And we're thankful, Lord, that you're just as close as mentioning your name. Lord, you've been at the end of the road waiting on us, Lord. And tonight we're coming home, God. Thank you, Jesus. standing in the gap for someone you've got a prodigal in your life that you're ready for them to come home I want you to stand to your feet tonight I'm not going to embarrass you in any way but we're going to have a prayer of faith tonight I want you to stand to your feet we're going to believe for the Lord to move praise the Lord if you're standing around somebody or seated around somebody that's standing just reach over and put your hand on their shoulders Father, tonight in this loving family that you've given us, Lord, we surround each other, Lord. We surround each other, Lord, and we cover each other, Lord. And we pledge to one another that you won't walk it alone. We will shoulder the burden with you. We will love you. We will carry the burden with you. Tonight, God, we pray for brokenness, Lord. 
Lord, let the power of the Holy Spirit just be unleashed in this place, God. Lord, we call their names out before you, Lord. We love on one another, Lord. We, we're going to celebrate with one another when this happens, God. We release them into your hands, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We stand in faith tonight, Lord. We stand up, God. We stand up and proclaim that today is the day of salvation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love, Jesus. Thank you for your great love, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Praise the name of the Lord. Lord, you're faithful, Lord, when we're faithless, God. You are able, Lord, when we've got nothing left to give, Lord, and we don't think we can take another step, Lord. Your strength is perfected in our weakness, Lord. And it's okay to be weak and to throw ourselves on the cross, Lord. Lord, we need your strength. And I pray for an empowering for every person, Lord, that's standing in that gap tonight, Jesus, for someone. Give them a strength, Father. Give them an endurance, Lord, and a, and a patience to stand, Lord. Lord, a new fervor and a new zeal, Lord, to call those names out before you every day, God. Help them to carry that burden with excellence, Lord. Lord, let your power be unleashed in their life, Lord. Lord, as they stand in the gap, Lord. In Jesus' name. God. Well, Father, I pray tonight over this congregation, Lord, as we're dismissed. Lord, may they be blessed in their coming in and in their going out this week, Jesus. Lord, may they wake up, Lord, and sense your presence every single day, Lord. Lord, may the joy of the Lord be their strength this week, Lord, and may they live in the peace of the Holy Spirit. Lord, despite what storm they're in, Lord, may they always be aware that you're in the boat with them. Bless them in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I love you guys. Love on each other tonight as you're dismissed. Have a great week.